Hello and welcome to this week's 1829 talk. Uh, you're very welcome. I am Professor Annie Tindley uh, and it's my honour to be one of the trustees uh, of the Natural History Society of Northumbria and to be introducing these 1829 series of talks to you. Um, the 1829 talks um, highlight and celebrate uh, the year of our foundation uh, as a society, as one of the oldest uh, and most honourable uh, natural history societies uh, in Britain. And the purpose of these talks is to allow a platform and showcase uh, for the most exciting and cutting edge new research being undertaken by our early career researchers. So they're here really to, to share with us the latest findings in environmental research. As such, I hope you enjoy uh, this week's talk um, and I could urge you, if you can, to follow us on social media, uh, Natural History Society uh, of Northumbria, and enjoy the talk. Hello everyone. Thank you for coming along to listen to my talk today and thank you to the NHSN for inviting me to come and talk. Um, I'm going to speak to you today a little bit about my work comparing photos and videos from camera traps for use in wild mammal monitoring. So yeah, hello, <laughs> just a little bit about me. My name is Sean Green. I'm a PhD researcher from the University of Durham and I work with the citizen science project MammalWeb. Um, I'm particularly interested in camera traps, so what are the best ways to set them up, what can we do with the data that we collect from them, and how can we engage more people in using camera traps to help study wild mammals. So I've already said camera traps like 10 times, some people might know what they are, but not everyone does. So a brief introduction to them. Essentially, they are heat motion activated cameras. So they're quite clever in that most of them um, detect temperature, um, detect surface temperature of objects. Um, and as most mammals or most animals will have a different surface temperature to their background. So the background often being the ground, trees, grass, bushes, things like that. When an animal moves in front of a camera, it means the cameras can, the sensors on the camera detect that change and are triggered to start taking either a video or a series of photographs. So this is really useful for studying um, wildlife. Essentially what we use them for is finding out what the animals are up to when we are not around. So they um, cause relatively little disturbance, so particularly you know compared to us being there in person. So we can leave them out in the field for weeks or even months at a time, um, which is also great for us because it means we can be at home having a cup of tea while the camera's doing the hard work. Um, and we can use them to look at which species are living in an area. We can look at how many um, how many animals are there, so things like abundance or density. We can look at the diversity of the different animals that are living in an area. Um, and we can also collect behavioural information as well. Um, so what, what sort of times are animals active and what are they getting up to? So camera trap technology has advanced really rapidly in recent years, which is great for us that are using them. Um, it's lots of fun. Um, but it means we now have lots of different options and we have some decisions to make when we're setting up our camera trap. So one of the main things we need to decide when setting them up are whether we're going to have them taking videos or photographs. Um, now, does it really matter? Um, this is essentially one of the big questions of my PhD. Previously, criticism of video has been that the trigger speed on videos are, is too slow. So trigger speed is really important because that's the time between when a camera detects that an animal is there and when it actually starts videoing or taking a photo. Now, if an animal is moving really quickly and the camera reacts too slowly, then you'll just end up with a blank video and no record of that species, um, which is obviously not what we're after. On the other hand, are photos going to miss things? So if your camera is just taking 
you know, two or three photos when it's triggered compared to, you know, a solid 20 seconds of video, are you actually going to miss some of the things that are happening if you only have the photos? Now, why would it matter if there's a slight difference between um, data sets from video or photo settings? Well, essentially, we want to get the best quality data that we can from our survey. Um, you know, how can we make informed conservation decisions unless we have the best quality data that we can? So if, you know, one setting is preferable to another, we want to know which that is. If we can understand whether the data from different settings is, is different or not, um, this can inform whether we can combine data sets from different studies or compare them as well. So if we can combine data sets, um, it means that maybe different researchers that have had slightly different settings out in the field um, can then you know, collaborate in different ways and make bigger data sets um, and collect more data on a species. Or if two people have done surveys in different areas with a very similar setup, but maybe someone's used photos and someone's used videos, is it fair to then compare those two data sets? So yeah, I decided I was going to test this essentially by sticking two camera traps together on a little bracket with one of them taking photos and one of them taking videos and use this um, setup cam at camera trap station to do a survey, do a wildlife survey. And I decided I was going to do this in the Forest of Dean. So that's in the southwest area of the UK. Now there are a few reasons for choosing the Forest of Dean. So it's a very popular sort of tourist destination as well. So in terms of, you know, engaging members of the public in research, which is very important to me, um, you know, I thought lots of people are going to be interested in the kind of wildlife that's living in this forest. And this forest does have lots of really interesting wildlife um, going on in it. So it's an interesting place to study within the UK. So it has some um, invasive non-native species, so such as the Reeves mudjack. So while they're a very <laughs> small, cute and fluffy deer, um, they're not native to this country and we actually have very little data on their distribution. Um, so it's always important to understand how you know, non-native species might be fitting into our ecosystem. It's also one of the few sites in the UK where there are wild boar now roaming freely and um, it's very interesting to understand how wild boar are again fitting back into our ecosystem having been absent for such a long time and especially as they can be considered ecosystem engineers so the way that they will dig through and root up soil you know they turn the soil over um, so this might make habitat more or less suitable for other species um, but it also could mean that there is conflict with humans so it's all very well them digging up, you know, and turning over the soil in the forest, but they move, if they move into agricultural land around the forest, they could do a lot of damage to crops. So it's important to understand the distribution of this species and how many there are and where they're most active um, in order to inform any management that needs to happen. So the Forest of Dean is also the site of a very exciting project to reintroduce pine martens um, to this part of England. So they're being translocated from healthy populations in Scotland down to the Forest of Dean. And it's the first project of this type to happen in England. Um, and as with any kind of conservation project like this, it's really important to monitor the species that you're introducing to understand whether um, basically your project has been successful or not, really. So initially the pine martens are collared, so you can see on, on that picture there, it's got a radio collar on it, so they can be radio tracked. But these collars will naturally fall off within the first year or so of, of the translocation. So once the collars are gone, we really need an effective way of monitoring the population to assess um, yeah, how, how well it's doing. So the team at the Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust who are leading this um, Pine Martin project were really keen to have some camera traps out in the forest and see if we can use them to help with the Pine Martin monitoring. 
So we put our pairs of cameras out in 74 different locations. We had 15 pairs of these cameras, so we had to rotate them between sites. We had each pair of camera at each site for around a month. Um, and this survey was done between November of 2019 and March of 2020. We did have to finish a little bit early um, because of the first lockdown. Um, so we had to bring our cameras and that in a little bit early, but we already had lots of data. So we're not too worried about that. So in that time, we'd already collected over 6,500 videos and over 80,000 photographs. Um, but when the cameras were fo uh, triggered to take photographs, they would take eight photographs um, in a sequence. So this kind of means we had at least 10,000 photo sequence triggered. So how many different species did we detect with the different methods? So from my video data set, I have 30 different species were detected. 12 of these were mammal species and 18 of these were bird species. From the photo data set, we detected 27 different species. So we had the same 12 mammal species, but this time only 15 bird species. And if we look at the figures um, beneath these, so each of the little circles represents one of the locations where we had a camera trap station set up. And so you can kind of see the shape of the forest and the survey. So cameras were set out in sort of a grid formation throughout the forest with each camera spaced one kilometer away from its neighbor. And if you just were to glance at those two figures quickly, you would see that essentially they look very similar and the size of each dot reflects how many species were detected at that site. So you can see the sites um, where there are more species detected um, tends to be the same on both figures. So essentially the photo and the video data sets are very, very similar, which is cool. So in terms of the three birds that were missed, so this is a still taken from one of the videos, it's slightly confusing, but the bird moves so quickly in the video you can't really see it. But essentially, yeah, the birds that we did capture on the video survey, but not from the photo data, was a blue tit, which we had two videos of from just one location, one video of a tree creeper, and one video of a willow tip. And essentially, if I was wanting to go out and survey small birds like this, I would not be using camera traps at all as a methodology. So while it's kind of interesting, you know, to see the videos of this animal, it's not really telling us a lot, you know, about video versus photo for camera trapping, because we wouldn't really use that as a method for these species. So going back to some of the species we identified as species of interest for that area, so if we look at wild boar, um, we have a very similar number of events, so a number of occasions which wild boar were detected from both the video survey and the photo survey. Um, and they were detected at slightly more sites, so 61 sites from the photo survey compared to 56 for the video survey. And we can also see that wild boar are present and pretty well distributed throughout the whole of the forest of Dean. So where are the wild boar? They're everywhere. Um, just to draw your attention ever so slightly to this slightly separate forest patch on the left. Um, so it might look that there is less wild boar activity in this area because the dots are slightly smaller. However, this was the location of our final camera sites. So it means that these cameras were only out for two weeks, whereas at every other location they were out for four weeks. So in terms of comparison, um, we need to be a little bit careful about how we treat the data from that particular location. However, overall, again, these two figures look very, very similar. So on a broad scale, we're getting very similar data from both sets. And though there were a couple of sites where they were detected on the photo survey, but not the video survey, these still tend to be sites where there was only maybe one or two detections on the photo survey that would just happen to have been missed by the video survey. Um, so, you know, it might be possible that photos have a slight 
advantage um, in terms of you know how well they detect species when there's not a lot of activity at a site um, but broadly speaking we're getting very similar results for the wild boar here and again if we look at our reeves muntjac the data sets again look incredibly similar for both the video and photo surveys um, yeah the two the two figures are almost <laughs> identical um, however what's interesting Again, if we kind of look at that little forest patch on the left, we can see even though we know we only had the cameras out for two weeks in that area, it still looks like relatively quite a lot of muntjac activity. Um, so it could be interesting to look into that a little bit more um, and see if there's, you know, something about that smaller forest patch that the muntjac seem to prefer. Another species that we haven't really mentioned yet, but that is of interest is the grey squirrel. So this is because it is another invasive non-native species um, and is often of interest to forestry managers as it can do damage to trees. And they are fairly abundant throughout the forest. So we had similar numbers of events again for the video and photo projects. So over well, nearly 800 um, different captures for each survey. And again, there were particular sites where there was a lot of activity and then some where they were just picked up occasionally. And again, we're seeing slightly um, more sites where they were detected on the photo survey compared to the video survey. So again, possibly hinting that the photos could be slightly better at particular sites um, but again in general we're seeing very similar results however even if we think some species are being picked up at more sites by the photographs some animals can actually be a lot harder to spot in a photo compared to a video now I'm going to tell you that there is a grey squirrel in this photograph but if you are struggling to spot it, then you're very much not alone. So I uploaded the footage from my survey to Mammal Web, which is a citizen science project, which invites um, anyone who wants to, to go onto our website and help to classify camera trap footage. Um, so then I compared the classifications from Mammal Web users to my own classifications to see if people using Mammal Web found it easier to identify species from a photo or a video by looking at how many um, correct classifications were submitted. So in general, people were more accurate at classifying video footage. And there seemed to be a larger difference in classification accuracy for certain species compared to others. Um, so here we've identified grey squirrel and small rodents, which would include things like mice, voles and shrews. So with the camera methodology that we had set up, it would be essentially impossible to determine, you know, species of small rodents. So we kind of lumped them all into one category. So essentially what people are, need to identify here is just whether there is some kind of small rodent in that footage and they're not asked to really identify what species that is. And again, with a grey squirrel, once people have identified the grey squirrel, once people have seen the grey squirrel, they're quite good at identifying what it is. They're quite well known, well recognised. However, the problem is actually spotting these animals in the first place. So if they're not moving, um, in a photograph, they can be really hard to spot. Whereas in a video, if we can see movement, your eyes automatically drawn to that movement. And once we've, we've seen it, it's a lot easier to recognize what's there. Interestingly, we also see a fairly um, large difference for wild boar as well. And so while wild boar are a lot bigger than, you know, mice or squirrels, they blend into the forest surprisingly well. So they're generally active at night, which means the footage that we have of them is mostly in black and white. And they're a very um, dark coloured animal. 
And if they're not moving, they can look surprisingly similar to, to a bush or a rock just, you know, blending into the background of the forest. Whereas if we have a video, again, we can have movement, which helps us identify that there's something there. And wild boar are also quite noisy. So if there's kind of a dark blurry thing on your, on your video, but then it starts making grunting piggy noises, that's definitely a bit of a giveaway in helping you identify what is there. So briefly going back to this photo, because I felt it would be very mean of me to move on without actually giving you the answer for all of those who are still thinking about it. Your grey squirrel head is just there at the edge of the screen, blending in with the leaf litter very, very well. So what does all this mean? Well, broadly speaking, the video and the photo data sets were incredibly similar. This means it would be possible to combine or compare data sets that were collected um, you know, with photo or with video. And this is really important because in you know, wildlife conservation, a lot of projects are held back by a lack of funds, a lack of time, uh, a lack of resources. So if we can uh, collaborate di with different projects and we can use the data more efficiently, um, which is really important. And in terms of citizen science, this can give us some more flexibility. So particularly for the Mammal Web project, people can participate in this project in two main ways. So one is by setting up their own camera trap and then uploading that footage to Mammal Web, or by going to the website and classifying footage that other people or organisations have uploaded to it. Now, previously, we only allowed people to upload photo footage. However, if you're using your own camera trap at home, you might prefer to use a video setting um, just because you enjoy videos. And so you might have been discouraged from participating in Mammal Web because you would rather have your camera on photo or video. And again, when, it's when it comes to classifying footage, some people may prefer and may find video more engaging or may find that they prefer classifying photos. But with a project like Mammal Web, we're trying to get as much data as possible and get as many people as possible engaged. So if by having these options and that flexibility, we can get more people involved, then that's definitely a win. And again, some projects may benefit in particular from using video when it comes to classification accuracy. So if people find it easier to identify species in a video, so in general, when it comes to citizen science and camera trapping, um, literally everyone makes mistakes when we're trying to classify camera trap footage. It's so easy to miss a species. And so it's quite a common practice, particularly in citizen science, to get multiple people to classify each video or each photo sequence so that can, we can increase our confidence um, in having a correct classification. So, for example, if we have a few people that have identified footage and they all agree that it's a wild boar in that, you know, photo sequence or video, um, then we can be more sure that, yes, that is a wild boar. However, if we got several different um, species being classified in that footage, then it could be that it's not possible to, you know, correctly identify that species or maybe it needs an expert to come and review it or that we just need more classifications from more people before we can be sure what is present within that footage. However, this can mean that you need lots of people to be involved in your project and it can take a lot of time to get enough classifications. However, if people find the videos easier to classify and are more accurate, it could mean that we just need two or three people to check each video before we can be really confident um, of our data set. So this is important, particularly for maybe smaller projects um, or, you know, projects that are interested in collecting data on those kind of small hard to spot species as well. Um, hang on a second. So I mentioned that we chose the Forest of Dean because it was a very important site for the exciting 
translocation of pine martens. And then I haven't really mentioned them since. So we had a bit of a hiccup <laughs> in terms of pine martin data collection in that from all the 74 locations and thousands of videos and thousands and thousands of photos, we collected about three records of pine martens and those were basically pine martin bums running away, um, which was quite disappointing for all of us, I will say. Now, there are two reasons why this could have happened. Reason one, which I am, you know, a fan of this theory, is that the pine martins gathered and decided they were going to mess with our survey by deliberately avoiding our camera traps and trying to ruin things. However, a slightly more scientific reason could be that simply the methodology was not appropriate. So it's quite a big forest and there's not very many pine martens in it. And it could just be that we did not have enough cameras. The spacing was wrong, so we could have had you know, more different sites and the sites being closer together, um, or that we just needed to set the cameras up in a different way. So we have learned something. We have learned how not to survey for pine martens. So, you know, it's learning something is, is good. Um, but obviously this was not exactly what we wanted. However, <laughs> we're not about to give up just yet. Um, so this doesn't quite apply to Zoom meetings, unfortunately, but in the normal world, how would you get people to attend an event when they don't really want to go? Well, as a student, especially, I understand the importance of offering free food. Um, in terms of wildlife monitoring, we might more formally refer to this as bait. So pine martens are omnivores. Um, they'll eat all sorts in the wild. So, you know, small mammals, eggs, fruit, nuts, things like that. And so peanut butter and eggs actually makes fantastic pine martin bait. So these are highly nutritious, high calorie, high in protein. Um, what pine martin could possibly resist? So we put a few cameras back out um, at some bait stations with some peanuts, some eggs, some peanut butter, and decided to see if we could get some pine martin footage. And so far, it seems to be working. So in that little box, there's a peanut. So that's what that, that pine martin was after there. So unfortunately, I have not been able to get down to the forest as much as I would like, because I'm based in Durham currently. However, my lovely friends from the Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust, who are based um, at the Forest of Dean, have been able to look after some cameras for me and start collecting some, you know, more data, which is really cool. So now we're interested in seeing if we can take it one step further and try and identify the individual pine martens that are living in the forest. So pine martens have um, what we would call a bib. So you can see the creamy white fur um, extending across the chest and across the chin. And they have different markings on these bibs. So no two, mine, two pine martin bibs are exactly the same. Um, so as they are unique, it means we could use them to try and identify different individual pine martins. So if we look at this one, we can see that there are different markings around the edge of the bib, so it's kind of uneven where the white, where the lighter fur meets the darker fur. And we can see here, there's this kind of like square patch of dark fur coming into the bib, and this matches the diagram. So this diagram was drawn um, when the pine martin was examined because it was sedated in order to be translocated. And so at that time, researchers had 
a very good view of the pine martens and were able to draw diagrams of each of their bibs. And now we can try and match up the camera trap photos to these bibs. So yeah, we can see that kind of squarey patch of darker fur on that side and then opposite it, there's another sort of line of darker fur coming in there. So this means we can see that this pine martin matches this bib pretty well. And this is the bib of Pine Martin FD03, um, which stands for Forest of Dean number three. So this is the third Pine Martin to have been introduced into the Forest of Dean. Um, and hopefully you can kind of see what I mean there with the bib markings. Um, um, I'm not just making it all up, you can see. And, um, yeah, so if we can identify individual Pine Martins, we can monitor them in a lot more detail. So we can tell where different individuals are living within the forest. We can see if they're maybe interacting with other pine martins. Um, we can see if they're healthy. Um, we'll be able to see if they have kits. So this is a female and if um, it's very hard to tell sometimes whether the pine martins have bred. But if she has had young this spring, um, then once they get old enough, they're likely to follow her to these bait stations and start following her around. So we'd be able to see then whether she has had kits or not. So all of these things are really important for monitoring the success of a pine martin introduction. Um, so while it can be really difficult to identify individual pine martins from these bib patterns, it is possible as long as the pine martin is looking um, you know, towards the camera and we can see its bib. So we have actually created a new project on MammalWeb, inviting people to have a go at trying to identify these individual pine martins, um, which is really exciting. So it is difficult, but if you're interested, please do go and have a go. There are very few citizen science projects anywhere in the world asking people to identify individual animals like this. Um, and this is the first one that we know of um, doing it for pine martins. So it's very exciting and it's very new. So if you would like to get involved, please do. Um, you can get involved by going to our website, www.mammalweb.org um, and joining up. So literally anyone and everyone is invited to come and have a go. So I'm still looking for classifications for my original Forest of Gene photo and video projects. So the data you've seen today um, is, is preliminary. So it's gonna kind of probably look very similar to that, but we are still collecting more classifications, so it could change slightly. Um, and again, you know, we're launching this new Pine Martin project, um, which we're very excited about. And, you know, it is new, so it might be developing a little bit over the coming months. Um, but yeah, if anyone wants to have a go, um, any feedback again is, is very welcome. Um, and you can follow MammalWeb on social media as well, if you want to keep up with the project news. So we're on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. Or if you're interested in my research, you can follow me on Twitter for occasional updates and cute animal videos. So yeah, I hope you have enjoyed my talk and thank you for listening.